Hello, this is Anka Corbin. I'm here with Globig in London, speaking with Martin Davis from Ignite. It's an accelerator. Martin and I had a chance to meet in Colorado when he was bringing one of his cohorts uh, into Colorado to see what the startup scene was like. So this time it's our chance to come and talk a little bit about you know, what it's like to bring a company here into London and what the startup scene is like. So thank you so much for taking the time. No problem, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for having me on camera. <laughs> so if a company, a US company, is considering coming into London, give us a sense of what they need to prepare for and where they could go. Because it's really hard, I think, to just start from ground zero. Like, what do companies, especially smaller, fast-growing tech companies, you know, what do they need to consider? And, and you know, like, where could they soft land, if you will? So for companies that are considering coming to the UK, I think the best thing to start by doing is actually visiting and actually checking out all of the different cities that we have here. Now, for a lot of American companies, they're probably going to choose London as their main base. Um, the likelihood of they're already operating in the United States um, and actually wanting to open up here is that they're going to want to open up in kind of the metropolitan center, the capital city, the place where all of the business happens, um, which does make sense. But depending on the size of the business, uh, London may not necessarily be right for them uh, from a cost point of view, uh, from an access to talent point of view, from an infrastructure point of view, uh, and just from an overall noise point of view. Like London has become, you know, quite an expansive tech hub at this point, but it also means that without a business having the ability when it arrives to necessarily cut through particularly quickly it can be quite overwhelming and quite noisy so my recommendation would be actually coming to visit uh, beforehand and taking a look at not just London but a couple of the other kind of major cities that we have here in the UK that are also starting to bubble up as pretty heavy tech centers at this point so you know you have Manchester which is right in the middle of the country it's just a two-hour train ride away from London uh, very easily commutable in that sense it's very quick to get back down here if you need to be here to do business but yet if you based yourself there you'd be looking at a significant access of talent when it comes to technology when it comes to uh, people to come and work for the company company you know some really fantastic universities if you're looking for graduates and interns coming out of that area as well plus rent is significantly cheaper both in terms of commercial space but also just in terms of the overall cost of living um, it is around about you know a quarter less than what it would be here if not significantly more than that depending on where you decide to live um, other areas that are also popular are um, Edinburgh and Glasgow up in Scotland as well um, they have very much their own ecosystem there it's far enough away from London for people to kind of have had to support themselves without necessarily having the city behind them uh, but again fantastic universities great amazing spaces in terms of co-working for people and you know access to capital isn't that difficult there as well I mean they've got uh, you know quite a decent set of unicorn companies um, up there already and they're always looking to try to fund uh, more of them starting up there as well plus it's also the home of the Royal Bank of Scotland so when it comes to banking they're obviously pretty good too um, it's also got uh, quite a lot more connection I find up there with the United States there are a lot of, of companies that tend to uh, go from Scotland over to the States then uh, and also companies that tend to go in the States over to Scotland um, it started particularly back in the days of gaming. Um, Rockstar Games and Take-Two, uh, northern companies that expanded further north and then grew over to the United States when they were making uh, games like Grand Theft Auto. Uh, but there is a significant amount of people that kind of come from that world that are now just sitting around there waiting to do angel investments as well. So the overall advice is come and check out the whole country first before making a decision. But then if you do decide to land uh, in any particular place, there are always going to be a number of problems that, that companies moving into the UK are going to face. Uh, they're the typical ones that you would expect around, you know, getting initial proof of residence to actually, you know, set up the business over here. You need to set up a UK limited company, which is actually very fast to do comparative to some other places. Um, you can actually do it within a 24 hour period if you've got all of your paperwork in place and if you have a proof of address then that's all fine one of the bigger problems is typically setting up a bank account over here which has been tricky i've had companies that have been even based here in the uk that have had to wait between 8 and 12 weeks to open a business checking account um, and when we've had companies coming over from elsewhere in Europe uh, or elsewhere in the world to come and do an Ignite program, uh, they've struggled uh, to actually get their accounts up and running in a timely fashion. And that's got a lot more to do with the fact that they, 
bank's approach to working with these early stage companies isn't the same as what it should be or what it is elsewhere in the world. If you go to countries like Estonia, it's way, way faster to do this kind of stuff because they have generally more supportive overall ecosystem around this kind of stuff. But over here in the last year, it has got a lot better. There are banks here now that can turn a business account around within the same day. Uh, for a business if all of your paperwork is in order now typically getting that stuff set up doesn't take too long it's not that difficult to do um, some of it will be visa dependent um, but there are obviously plenty of people that are coming from the United States that also choose to come over here because they happen to hold dual citizenship and they have a European passport uh, either from grandparent or parent for whatever reason which means it would be super easy for them to do all they have to do is just move in someplace and get a, a utility bill and then they can pretty much do everything that they would need at that stage to get up and running um, and then outside of that you know they're ready to operate it's just a case of finding somewhere to actually put yourself day to day so that you can build out the company now we're talking early stage when we do this obviously for larger companies that have got more of a footprint in the united states that are looking to open up a subsidiary uh over here it is going to be a little bit different but the likelihood that they can afford to just go to a uh a company to just set this stuff up so i worked for a company previously that was a u.s company that set up over here in the uk that just jumped in with a company called fitzgerald and law and they took care of everything for them set up everything for them but they could afford to do that and I think if the company's large enough to actually do that, doing that expansion isn't necessarily tricky. It's just that you've got to hand it off to somebody because it's quite time intensive. If you're going to operate with a main base in the United States and then have your UK company as a subsidiary of that, or if you're going to flip it the other way and have your UK as a main base and then your US company is going to be a subsidiary. It's legally and tax uh, challenging for folks. So it requires a little more effort. But from an earlier stage, I guess if we were looking at companies that were sort of less than 10 people or you know had raised sort of less than you know a million dollars at this point that decided they were going to do a wholesale shift it isn't difficult to do um, and it's a very welcoming city when it comes to you know having that happen because for a lot of people here the ambition is potentially to you know build it big here in the UK and then move to the United States but we always love it when people do it the other way around so let's talk about two things you had mentioned. One was the bank account is difficult to get. Um, what are some of the banks specifically that startups will use here? Like I know we have Silicon Valley Bank and Wells Fargo. Those seem to be the two that pretty much everyone thinks about. Who are the, what are the banks that you think about here? Uh, our typical high street banks are the ones that people tend to go with. Um, but as I said, they are now only really coming around to the idea that this you know tech startup scene really exists and starting to build packages that make a lot of sense for them they've been a little they've been a little bit slow around doing it so we have silicon valley bank here as well you can uh, you can get an account with them uh, if you want to um, I can't speak to how quickly they can actually turn that around for people, but I'm expecting that if you were coming from the United States and you already had an account with SVB and you wanted to move it over here, that they'd probably be able to do that relatively quickly. The The main bank that seems to be doing the most in terms of being able to quickly turn around accounts for people, um, whether it's business or otherwise, is a, a bank that's called Metro Bank. It's very new. Um, they have kind of taken the rule book as far as banking goes and just kind of flipped it on its head. So you can take all of your uh, information around your company, which is your company registration certificate, your proof of address, walk in, get an appointment same day, and walk out not only with your business account set up, but actually with the cards printed. Um, they do them in store for you as well. So you don't have to wait for post to arrive. You're not waiting weeks for this kind of stuff. You can literally have it all done and dusted within 48 hours. And we have a team on our program that's happening right now that was having some issues with that. And we, uh, we actually put them into, uh, into Metro Bank to do it. So not only did they register the company within 24 hours, but they had a company set up and they had the bank account running in less than 48 hours. So brilliant business idea, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Talk it's way better now than it has been because we've we've had teams waiting on accounts for eight to twelve weeks which is it's just a nightmare when you're trying to actually move forwards waiting to actually put the money into something is okay. it's really tough it just feels like a problem that yeah. no one should have but right. but yet they do but you know it's got significantly yeah. better over the last year and hopefully it's going to continue to get better as well with some of the new digital banks that are coming out some of the new challenger banks that we have based here um, the likelihood that they will be even more startup focused or more focused on helping early stage companies get up and running quicker um, is it, definitely more likely which makes that it, hopefully it's going to become easier and more exciting to play with the money once you get it yeah. 
when a company is moving here, they typically want a place to start, and certainly co-working spaces are a really big deal in the U.S. How does that work here in the U.K.? And if you do have them, what are the best ones, and where do you see companies going? We have more co-working spaces in London at this point than we have ever had before, and they're starting to proliferate across the whole of the UK as well now. But from the point of view of this city, um, there is a huge amount of space. Um, it's really down to the company to make the decision on what it is that they're looking for. Um, so you could go for, you know, kind of cheap and cheerful. It's, you know, no frills. Um, so, you know, I don't think they'll mind me saying it, but the space we're in right now, a Ministry of Startups, uh, which is where Ignite is based as well, um, isn't necessarily like the nicest looking place. It's a little rough and ready, but it's also one of the cheapest places to rent and also has, I think, one of the more kind of close knit communities within the building. Um, you know, all kinds of different companies, you know, are, are in here and some of them are very well funded and some of them are still waiting to get their funding. But, you know, the amount of money that people have raised doesn't necessarily kind of trip into what it is that they choose in terms of overall office space. Um, square footage in this city is incredibly expensive and there are pockets around the city where a lot of the companies tend to want to be. Um, this area around here um, has been traditionally the place where a lot of the tech companies have, have wanted to kind of migrate to, meaning that you know where buildings have become available on the whole they have been turned into co-working spaces because for those people that own them it's a fantastic way of maximizing the pound on every single square foot that you can get out of the building. Um, and uh, you know we've had significant players like WeWork have ended up in the city now with I think uh, five spaces at this point uh, across the city. Which, you know, given that it's not the largest city in terms of expanse, so there's a lot of people here, but it's not exactly the widest city. It's only kind of 12 miles across. Um, that's a lot of spaces, but there is an incredible amount of companies and plenty of people that want to be in there. Now they're an expensive place, but. Uh, for a lot of people, you know, th that's what they're looking for is they want to be a part of that brand, they want to be a part of that world, they want everything that kind of comes with that, they want all the sort of, you know, they want the free beer that they have there, you know, brilliant, okay, that's cool, if that's what you want, um, but if you're looking for something that's maybe a little bit more budget conscious, there are places like Ministry of Startups that will work for you as well, and then there's a ton of places that, that sort of sit in between uh, as well, and it depends if you want an office, it depends if you want open plan and how many people you're going to be, and you know, what a lot of companies tend to not think about as well is that what are your expansion plans what do you think you know your business is going to be in a year's time and can the space that you choose accommodate the fact that you maybe are going to grow by 10 people over that period of time you know and are you going to be able to do that within the building that you're in or are you going to have to move um, you know can you afford it if you do that you know it's there is a tremendous amount to think about um, and it's it feels like quite a peripheral thing for a company to have to deal with when they should be focusing on just building out the business and doing what they're doing but the kind of the day-to-day -day office operations are almost just as important but you know, companies that we work with tend to find themselves in all kinds of different places from you know if they graduated university sometimes there's programs that will offer them free space for a period of time we work have got a program going on at the moment where they give they're giving people the first three months for free and a lot of people are taking advantage um, of that you know it's Typically, the trend seems to be that you know if they're early stage and they are somewhat funded or not funded at all, they're just going to try and go for as close to free as they can. And there are spaces that you can do that in uh, here. And it also depends on how much of a close-knit team you want to have and how much of a day-to-day -day office environment you want to have. Um, because we're also seeing a lot more people opting to do the remote work kind of thing, um, meaning that they don't necessarily need to have quite such an outlay every month um, on space. But options are plentiful, but they're busy and they cost quite a lot of money. Um, outside of London, that's not quite so much the case. There are plenty of co-working spaces that are popping up, but on the whole, when they do pop up, they, they tend to be a lot more reasonably priced for the city than here. Whereas the, the pricing is demand-based here which means that it's always going to be pricey because there's a lot of demand. If you go to Manchester, there's plenty of great spaces to work, but they're also reasonably priced because the demand isn't quite so much that they have to turn people away, and the only way that they can do that is by charging more money. Um, so there are, there are a lot of new spaces up there. Being a former industrial city, meaning there's a lot of kind of warehouse space that's been converted, lots of new property popping up, um, and co-working tends to sit at the heart of pretty much every new build that we see, I, both here in London but also everywhere else as well, simply because from an overall maximization of the profit you can do, it's a great way of making money. Sure. So it's not going away anytime soon, but I, I think that there is, there is certainly a tipping point that I can see coming 
uh, here in the city overall of like the amount of space that's available and the price that some people are charging because there are some that are like 750 pounds per desk which is an incredible amount of money and you really have to ask yourself as a as a startup company whether you can justify spending that and if you are spending that are you really getting the value out of it right or are there better locations or are there equally good uh, opportunities somewhere else so can you i mean you know if you're going to be budget conscious you need to try and make every pound that you have work as much as possible and if you can save 400 of those pounds by renting a place elsewhere that's probably what you should be doing and you can do it's just shopping around and finding the places that feel right for you is it's hard to do here mm -hmm. so let's talk a little bit about just what makes the uk such a great place and why do you think companies usually expand here first. You know, let's try to get to the core of that. Um. I think for a lot of people it's because, well, from the financial point of view, you know, large you know, city, you know, leading on, you know, financial for the majority of Europe, it's a European financial sector, European financial hub. Um, you know, for a lot of people coming from outside of Europe, London and the UK is typically the gateway for a lot of them. It's where that they'll at least change a plane if they're going somewhere else. Um, and actually, you know, we're a very small island. The different cities that you could be in here mean that actually you're never too far away from where you'll probably be raising capital, from where you'll probably be doing business. Um, and if you've got ambition of kind of being, you know, a, having access to Europe in general, you know, everywhere that you would want to go really is only two hours away if you're here. Whereas if you're elsewhere in the world, then it's quite a significant journey and quite a significant cost. But with the amount of low budget airline carriers that we have coming out of this city, um, with the you know amount of routes and the amount of frequency that the flights tend to have, you know you can be back and forth to most of the major cities and most of the other tech hubs across Europe in the same day if you want to punish yourself. Um, but you know if you want to just trip away for one day and do business, then you absolutely can do. You know it takes the same amount of time to fly to as many places uh, in Europe as it does to take the train to Manchester from London so right. you know plus we've also got trains direct out of here to into Paris and Brussels which can give you another gateway into you know the Netherlands and Germany if you just want to do it by train so you don't you know even if you're scared of flying you can still get you know to the places that you need to be so it, it's it has a very hub like feel to it which I think is really part of the attraction um, and certainly for certain types of companies now um, London's really started to define itself as a center for particular types of company I think it's really put a stamp on the fintech um, yeah. Step, sort of things at the moment being you know having such a huge city you know here and having such a major kind of financial presence has meant that there's not only a lot of people coming out of the city doing companies doing startups now but also there's plenty of people that are you know already maybe have bases you know in New York and other financial centers that need to expand to grow their audience and then London would be the next natural fit for that after say you know other places like Singapore if they were going Asia Pacific uh, or Hong Kong London would be next if they were looking to do something that was financially led here then London would be the place to do it. Yeah.